That's hey everybody and welcome to the Higher Game Podcast. I am here with my friend, God, Dr. Susan Campbell. We've known each other, I think, over a decade. Yeah. And I originally found you when I was researching um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And I was curious about sort of the process of how people grow. And I came across your book, The Couple's Journey, which is very different. Then I came across your book, Truth and Dating. Yeah. And I have five-minute relationship repair somewhere. And uh, I've recently been teaching one of your books, which I'd like to start talking about, um, mm -hmm. which is called Getting real. I almost said getting fucking real because of your relationship with Brad Blanton, who would probably say that. Um, <laughs> and welcome, first of all, Dr. Susan Campbell. Thank you, Adam. Susan has been a therapist, a coach, a teacher, professor uh, around many aspects of psychology, but mostly around relationship and I don't know what to call it, emotional maturity or emotional awareness. What would, how would you define that? Emotional development. And what does that mean to you? That means increasing your, over the lifetime, living a life where you pay attention to what's going on inside and around you, see if you get the results you want, and developing so that you have more and more capacity to handle more and more of life. Developing to handle more and more in life. I know you and I were talking earlier and you said something that I always say, that the more you've learned about human psychology and the more people you get to know, <laughs> that you find it hard to believe that anyone gets along together <laughs> over a course of years. Now, I say that often. I think it takes a lot of what I call skilled play rather than work. I like the term skilled play. Why, why, what do you see? Why do you think it's so hard for people to get along? Well, there's so many unconscious motives yeah. that drive people. And so a big passion of mine is helping you get onto yourself, like your unconscious patterns, such as somebody says, uh, do I look fat in this dress? you automatically think you have to answer the question just the way it's asked rather than check in with yourself first instead of giving the automatic answer yes no maybe or whatever hey what do i feel when you ask me that question and start with that like <clears throat> I, I i i feel scared when you ask me that question i have i have the fear that either answer i give you're not going to believe me <laughs> And any woman would say, that means I look fat, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> right. So, so the focus is on, and, and is on you and I were, are also talking about what's called parts integration or um, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, dialogue, voice dialogue. Oh, voice dialogue. We're, we're, we're in that conversation with wrong. ourselves. Yeah. Instead of just reacting with the outside world, you develop this inside conversation with the different parts, the different thoughts you have, the different feelings you have, the different personalities you have. And before you blather out some response to the world or a partner to really listen, like you said, check in and say, well, what, am I, what am I actually feeling? And to share that instead of answering someone's question. Yeah. And so, I mean, sometimes you'll have no fear. It just, it just, you only need to pause when you notice something that you're trying to cover up, like a fear. So I use that example because it strikes fear in the heart of many people when they hear that question. That's really funny. Uh, yeah, no fear. You, you go, uh, you look great. Or yeah, you do look kind of fat in that. <laughs> you know, if you're not afraid. But see, other than just the parts work that we were talking about before we went live, there's the layers of consciousness inside of a person. So they might have the, the fear of displeasing another person. That's not technically a part of you, although, you know, it could create the nice guy part. Right, or a nice you know, girl. Role in the world. Yep. But that, that's, that's a layer of the, the, the fear layer has so much complexity because so many things have happened to us that we wish hadn't happened. And a lot of them we repress, but we still go around scanning for danger in, in our uh, unconscious. We're scanning for, oh, uh, if I say this, then that bad thing is going to happen. So uh, that's the kind of self-awareness that I'm most excited about. Let's talk about that scanning for danger. Um, how, how does that show up in, in you know, forget about lions, tigers, or bears. Mm -hmm. How does that show up, or caravans, apparently. Um, how, how does that show up in, in your work with couples when you see what's going on with people? How do, they, oh, how do they see danger where danger may not exist? Yeah, well, your partner, let's say you have a partner, and you, let's say you live together, and your partner says, I'm going to bed now. And 
you had been hoping for a longer romantic evening with your partner. So you hear that as he's tired of being with me, he's starting to lose interest, and so your stories start running like I'm that. I'm not attractive, nobody wants me, I'm gonna be left yeah. alone. And then you can even <laughs> go into the, the, the defensive pattern then, you, you know, the next, the next thing you go into is, maybe I better stop pulling away so I don't need him so much. Maybe I, you know, should look elsewhere. Maybe this is the beginning of the end. So it, it's really sad to me how much of that stuff rules people's actual behavior. Yeah, and that's and that's why you're saying what couples don't get along because I, you know, if you don't have these skills, I don't, I don't know how people get through these moments, right? Yeah. Just by that yeah, little. It's unpleasant to see how many uh, fear patterns are in your personality based on childhood unfinished business, basically. Absolutely. You can clean up and adult intimate relationships are the best place to clean all that stuff up. It's but it absolutely. takes some conscious work. Do you find, I find that what, you know, because I've done so much of this reading and so much of this work, that it's hard for me to often to watch movies and TV shows where people just react out of what we're talking about, unconscious reactions, because you have to, right? You have to create conflict, but it's just so annoying to watch sometimes. Don't like, for example, I was watching this movie, uh, what's it, um, uh, A Star is Born? I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. No, and there's just like a moment where I'm like, I'm not interested in you anymore. That was the stupidest response. It was a totally unconscious, you know, response. I lost interest in you kind of as a character. I'm not that, do you find it hard to watch some popular media just because there are wiser ways of responding? Yes. I do. And there's better, there, there, there's better TV, especially some of these mini, mini series, you know, I won't, I don't know, All what right, go ahead. Are, what do you like? but there's a little bit better quality TV than there used to be. But that is yeah. true. Yeah, because there's trying, you know, we're trying to get the laugh. We, we say the ab absurdly stupid thing, which is actually quite common to say. Yeah. So, so I want to ask you two things. I want to ask you what, what are like three or four things that someone can do to avoid the kind of unconscious reactivity to start, start, start self-training so that they can actually get along over time. First, first admit that you do have some unconscious reactivity and try to get over any shame you might have about this. And in my work, I teach people the whole brain science behind the fact that there's one part of the brain called the survival alarm system that's always scanning for danger right. because that's basically what was known as the reptilian brain. So you know, in jungle times be before humans were you know, fully human, if there was a tiger uh, in the bushes, but all you heard was rustling bushes, you better run for your life or get out your spear whether it's a tiger or not. So now your partner says something in a flat tone of voice when you were hoping for a warm tone of voice <laughs> and your survival alarm system goes off. No, he's bored with me or something like that. There's disapproval in his voice. Disapproval. Mm -hmm. So um, if we understand that, that that alarm system is in all of us and that we can Notice the early warning signals of when that's happening, whether it's a fear story, like, you know, he's bored with me, or whether it's a body sensation, like the feeling of heat rushing into your face, that kind of thing. You learn to notice, first you admit that you have triggers, then you learn to notice some of the early warning signals of what, uh, of what a trigger feels like for you in particular. And each person has, you know, different signals. Some are more body oriented, some are more mind oriented, for example. You better hope that your partner cares, right? Because if you say something like, wow, when you said that, you know, my chest just tightened up and I just, you know, I noticed that suddenly I feel tense. And why? Well, because I, f I felt that was super critical. Well, I didn't actually mean that to be super critical. What I meant yeah. is- You have to have prior agreements about yes. how to work with these triggers so that you know, when you admit that you got hurt or triggered, it doesn't just trigger your partner. To go, oh, you're just too sensitive. Yes. Exactly. Know that one. That's, that's, that's what, well, that's what most of us are probably worried about when we start admitting that we have triggers. Maybe we have been told that we're too sensitive or too something.
yeah, you're too soft to handle it. I, I was married to someone a long time ago whose mother was incredibly cruel. And when, 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 her, when she felt hurt, she said, oh, you're just being sensitive. And I would, you know, I intruded with my heroic 23 year old self going, yes, she's being sensitive, but not too sensitive. Of course she's sensitive. She's alive, you know? Um, but, but it's, 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 there's, there's something about, I think in my, estimation and i'm wondering what you think mm -hmm. is uh is to be able to just um be the happy scientist of your own brain it's just yeah. to watch it and say wow i'm doing this and have a partner who says wow now i'm feeling this yeah. you know it's not like i am this but i feel threatened all of a sudden i feel really hurt suddenly oh i didn't mean that what i meant was, and just be curious yeah. instead of to identify with your feelings so how do you so the first thing was to admit that you, you know, you have unconscious patterns and how do you detach from, I mean, there's a lot of ways of answering this. Yeah. What do you recommend? Well, one thing you kind of just suggested is when you can reveal the feeling like I'm hurt, often that feeling goes away, yeah. particularly if your partner can hear it. Right. And, that so, makes it worse. And, and if they can't, then you have to work on the practice a little bit more to make it safe. Because what we want to do is create a safe container in any intimate relationship for these triggers to happen and for you to uh, get angry or upset or hurt or feel like you want to run out of the room. Um, make space for those and know that the best thing you can do is admit that they happen and deal with them as quickly as possible. And I even give people a script for what to do when your buttons get pushed. Ooh, can, we, can we hear that? I'd love to hear yeah. that. I'm sure. sure First thing it. is, First thing is you notice a sign that you're triggered, like, yeah. like my fists want to punch a wall, you know, that's a sign. So um, yeah. first thing you, you notice the sign, then you pause and you actually, if you're in interaction with your partner, you have a pause signal. Most people use the word timeout or pause, but some people, one couple that I work with has this, has just says Alpine. It's just a word. It doesn't mean anything, but they, they say that word. It's just, they call it their safe word. I just call it your pause agreement. So they need an agreement. And so then you calm your nervous system down because remember that survival alarm mechanism is a physiological thing and it makes your heart rate go faster and it makes your you know, blood rush to your muscles. So you wanna run or punch or something. Right. So you calm that down enough so that your focus now can be back in your, into your higher brain, your cerebral cortex, which can listen and cooperate and empathize. Mm -hmm. And not in this reptilian brain down here where you see your partner as a foe. Mm -hmm. So then once you're back here, then you come back and you talk about it. Now, there is one other thing you can do while you're calming yourself. And I call that the compassionate self-inquiry practice. I like that. Where you sit with yourself while you're pausing. You actually take a five-minute break from talking to your partner. You don't want to keep talking when no. people are triggered. Yeah. That just digs your hole deeper. Dan Tapkin in his book, Wired for Love, says, go take a walk for, he says it takes 20 minutes to calm you. It can take quite a bit of time. Yeah. It, each couple has to learn what it takes. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Hey, I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm triggered. I yeah. feel like fighting right now. And what do you think about this, Susan? I'm a guy. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He's a beard, right? Um, and I, I have said this to women uh, about uh, in, in their relationships. As a guy, like, it's fun to fight. You know, mm -hmm. in, in, in a bodily sense, I hate it in relationship, mm -hmm. but if a woman gets into a conflict with a guy, we're kind of built for that, you know, and there's a bodily excitation mm -hmm. that I experience sometimes when a fight happens, you yeah. know, um, I don't mean a physical fight, obviously, but yeah. it's like a kind of exciting mm -hmm. in a, not that I want it, but it feels good, to, ah, you know, to get into it with something, especially if we're not fighting like in the boxing ring or you know it's like it's an it's a, it's a it's like a physical release yes yeah, I don't good. and so sometimes i'll tell and I, I wonder if you see that with other men but i'll say i'm gonna go for a 20 minute walk and then i calm down i come back and i'm like oh i'm sorry i was really stupid i, I didn't mean what i said at all but do you find out with men that men are enjoy physically on some level that fighting you know arguing or is that just me I, th I think it's more of a personality style okay. thing, Adam. Maybe it's a little bit more of a male thing because, yeah. of course, men have more testosterone. 
Right. And that, that is associated with sex and aggression. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a given for males. Some women are high T women. I'm a high T woman. You know, I enjoy a, a good <laughs> fight too. And back in the Esalen days, we used to wrestle. Oh, you that's know? great. <laughs> we wrestled, physically wrestled. I remember having full out physical wrestling, wrestling matches. It's fun. With my husband. And boy, after that, you just feel exhilarated. But that's only a certain type of person. Okay, it's a personality thing. It's not some people, you know, male or female, they're really scared of Okay, that. some people don't like, good point, that good level point. Level of aggression. So you just find out who you're dealing with. And for some couples, especially if you're both physically fit and equally matched. Right. Wrestling right. might not be a bad idea. Or the other thing we used to do in the encounter groups was arm wrestling. Okay. We don't, we don't see that too much in the groups anymore. Because people really did get hurt. Yeah, you could get hurt. I guess now yeah, there would be lawsuits. Almost it's extra, it's extra for me because I'm a New Yorker. So I guess there's like extra enjoyment of fighting. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think about it, You've been at this game for a long time. Right? 50 been, years. 50 years. What, what's the fun for you? I'm just curious. I'm just looking at you and just wondering. You're, you keep smiling. So I'm like, what's, what's fun for you about being a psychologist now, you know, as opposed to when you were 20 or like, what do you love about what you do? What makes you happy? Gee, it's, it's, it's always fun because every day is unique and different and you never know. I mean, I, I see clients privately in my office. I also you know, teach groups and, and do webinars and stuff and they're mm -hmm. all here and now based. And wow. my work was always that way. I haven't mm -hmm. changed that much in what I do. I might package it a little different, mm -hmm. but it's basically present centered, awareness centered communication. Okay. And, that's wrestling. Uh, so that's what, no, that's what I love is the spontaneity. It's like every moment is improv. Oh, I love that. Every moment. It's, that's great. And less wrestling now that you're not in your twenties, right? <laughs> so I have less full on body contact. I've not been wrestling lately. Um, you, you, you said, I dance, you know, and do contact improv, but no. Oh, wow. That's no really funny. Wrestling. I had a woman friend. We were up in Northern California and we were doing contact dance improv. And she's from New York and she had never experienced anything. She was in Brooklyn. And she had never experienced. She goes, Adam, I go, what? She goes, I think I just had sex. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, well, I was sweating and there were people all over me. <laughs> it was like that that was like, um, you mentioned a couple of things. Thanks for that, by the way. That's great. I love that improv. I love that therapy is kind of improv because you're in the moment. Yeah. And there's a couple of things I want to sh have you share because they've been really valuable for me. Um, and I just think they're great distinctions. One is... Uh, in your book, uh, this is this is one that I have a Kindle. Sorry, so I can't hold it up and show it. Um, a wonderful, wonderful book, which I think is essential reading, called Getting Real, 10 mm -hmm. Truth Skills, uh, which is just, I have to say, a great book. And I was just rereading it and teaching it. And you make, there's two things I want to talk about. You want to make, you, you make a distinction between relating and controlling, that every utterance out of one's mouth, you're either relating to yourself, to another, to life, to the moment, or you're trying to control the world, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, that is like, if you're gonna study psychology, if you're interested in being a good partner or a good parent or good anything, that's where you start. I mean, do you see that as the foundational division? I do, I do think, and, and there might be time, well, let's, let's define relating versus controlling. And, and control. I'm talking about communicating in order to relate, which ba basically means two-way communication. It means my aim is to know and be known. So I'm revealing. I'm just revealing in the interest of transparency and connection with you. Uh, Martin Buber called it the I thou. Right, right. And it's it's present centered. Here we are. What are we feeling? What are we wanting? What are we needing? What are we not wanting? You know, bound, right. all that's here and now. Uh, controlling is, it's not just, when I say communicating to control, I don't necessarily mean being bossy or, or even overtly manipulative. Uh, my definition of control is you're trying to control the outcome, which is basically how the other person reacts or how they view you. So I don't want to be seen as needy, so I won't ask for um, sex tonight, that type of thing. That's controlling. You know, not asking for something is one of the most controlling things you can do because oh, you're trying to protect yourself from 
whatever unfavorable outcome you imagine you cannot handle. That's the word. So it's not about, I want people to really hear this because to me, this is so important. It's not about controlling another person. It's about controlling outcome. Yeah. And protecting yeah. your own ego, your own tender self. And we all have one. I'm not yeah. putting that down. I have a few. Yeah, but that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, that's it's so important. So the outcome could be, you know, internal control, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so when you speak, when you do something, are you actually alive? But I love that you called psychology improv. <laughs> you call, you know, what you, you said something about improv, that it's everyday improv. Um, mm. As long as you're alive to what's happening in the moment, people have done improv. That's the, that's the joy of being in improv or playing jazz, right? You're in the moment. You're responding to what's happening. It doesn't mean the outcome is going to be beautiful, perfect, or what you imagined. Yeah. You trust the unknown, or if you don't trust the unknown, because a lot of, a lot of us have trouble with that one, yeah. you learn to increasingly trust the unknown, that the next moment you'll have a response. Because if you just are aware of what's going on inside of you and you're willing to just reveal that, including what you need, because that's the most relevant piece of data is what do I want? What do I want from you? What do I want from myself? Uh, how do I want this interaction between us to go? Or just what am I feeling? You're not even sure what you want yet. Now that's, yeah. that's very good too. Or what, what, am my, what are my body sensations doing? I'm tense right now. Yes. I just tensed up when I heard you say that. And you don't even know why. You don't have to have explanations for everything. Trust it you and the other person can figure it out, figure out the next moment what to do from having all the data out on the table, hers <laughs> and yours, you know? Getting, and I, getting it on the table and not keeping it bottled up. Yeah. Um, no, it's great. I, I remember back to dating days. Um, to be able to say in the moment, hey, I kind of really like you and I don't know what to say right now and I feel really stupid because I wish I had something brilliant and fascinating to say, but I really don't know what to say. I'm just enjoying being here with you, you know? To, to share that kind of honesty. Right, that, and then stop. Don't keep talking. That's beautiful, Adam. <laughs> right, that's... So that's put a punctuation on the end and trust that, you know, because if you keep talking, then you're controlling again because you're, like, not sure what she's going to say back, and so you're not giving her any chance to say it. Yes, and then, so therefore, you're trying to control the moment. Beautiful all. spontaneity of what you just said, and then punctuate that with some silence, and then you've, you've got it nailed. You've got relating there. Because it brings her into, it brings your partner into relating when you yeah. do that. Because yeah, you're, right. you show vulnerability and real, getting real first. Yeah. Going back to your book, Getting Real, again, which I recommend to everybody. Um, no, it's funny and when some I- Some people will like this kind of disclosure and some people won't. Right. And if you're trying to please everybody in the world, or we're talking a little bit about dating now, right. if you're to please everybody in the dating world, what are you going to wind up with? You haven't, you haven't figured out if this person is somebody who is compatible with your style. No, it's true. It's true. It's funny. When I was up in San Francisco, I was on a TV show on ABC called How to Get the Guy. In. And the woman I met on the show, she found me from my profile. Mm -hmm. And she said, <laughs> the first thing she said, they were filming us for this TV show. She said, wow, you know, being here with you, and she's trained in authentic relating. She says, being here with you, I, I'm, I'm getting butterflies. And I said, wow, I... Uh, Usually girls just get crabs. <laughs> and it was so funny. It was very spontaneous. <laughs> and she fell on the ground laughing and we immediately had rapport, right? But they cut it. Oh. But, another story. But it was great because she was able to, and that was really one of the great appealing things about her was that she was able to notice her feelings, notice her bodily sensations in the moment without trying to force anything. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've given a similar example of a, a man who came up to me in the book, Truth and Dating. I think I give this example, come up to me and says, my hands are shaky and my sweat, my palms are sweaty. Yes. And I loved it. And not every woman will love it. That's true, because they don't want it. They don't want that kind of vulnerability. And but but the great thing is, if it's true for you and it feels good to state your truth, well, you've just filtered out somebody you don't want to be with. Yeah, which is really important. You know, two things about this truth in dating, and I want to talk about flirting. Um, but first, I want to ask. I was coaching someone the other night, very accomplished guy, mm -hmm. and he was saying that um, he was asking me about flirting, and and he says, you know. And I was, I was teaching him, I was actually quoting you. I was, I was saying there's this great distinction between relating in the moment mm -hmm. and having, trying to control the outcome. And he says, but isn't every, when you go dating, you're, you're trying to figure out the outcome all the time. 
how can I just be in the moment? I'm trying to figure out if this is worth my time. Is this someone I'm actually interested in? I had my answer. I'm really curious. How, how do you recommend people balance that being in the moment without attachment and expectation and still keeping an eye, is this guy good for me? Is this girl good for me? Oh, well, when I say, uh, you know, I mean, I talked about flirting with presence in the, in the book, Truth and Dating. That's just in the moment about what you're feeling and thinking right now. But um, if you really are aware that you've got a checklist and you want to go through it, you know, how much money do you have? How's your health? You know, do you have any injuries? Do you have any STD? <laughs> do it. That's part of truth telling is asking for what you want and not being afraid that the other person's gonna be turned off by your list. Or if you are afraid, say, you know, I got a list here, but a lot of women you know, that I've dated feel like they're being cross-examined, they tell me. But, you know, I'm into finding out as much as we can about each other quickly. Are you up for hearing my list? You know, and then she says yes or no. And maybe she says yes and she's lying, but you still, Give her your list and try to vet. Vetting your your potential partners is, of course, extremely important in the day. Right. So when I say presence, I just mean present with whatever's up for you. So if what's up is finding out information, you ask for information. If it's important, because he like he's someone who wants to meet someone, and he's ready. You know, he's mm -hmm. late forties, and he really wants to be with someone. Yeah. So if I were him, I would say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm forty-seven, and I'm really interested in meeting someone and I want to get to figure that out as fast as possible. I have a bunch of questions. Do you want to play? Yeah. I, would, I would put it, do you want to play a game? Right. Lovely. Lovely. I, I would love that. And I've, you know, I've brought the truth in dating card game to first dates and I haven't, ha I haven't found any resistance to it because, you know, I'm pretty good at sales. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not surprised. You've been at this a while. No, I, here's how, you know, if you want a second date with me, you're going to play this game with me. No, I'm just kidding. That's fine. Well, that's it. That's fine. That's no, fine. I, bring out the, I bring out the cards and I'll just say, you know, I've created this game. You want to play? And I haven't seen these so cards. I let, them, I let them look at the cards. You know, I don't foist it on a, a person because I remember this one guy who was an engineer. He'd never oh. um, done this kind of thing, but it just brought out the best in him and he loved it. Because he's never had that chance well, to actually... Yeah, to reveal personal things. Yeah, so there's a truth in... So besides the book, there's a, a thing called the Truth in Dating card game. Yeah. And you can get that on my website. What are some of the cards? What are some of the... On DrSusanCampbell.com or is it Susan Campbell? Uh, it's SusanCampbell.com. SusanCampbell.com. What do some of the cards say? Like what kind of questions? Oh, what's your, what's your ideal romantic evening uh, would be one. Or um, what's something you're afraid to, to tell me? That's a great one. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> on a first date. You know, yeah. Just what have what have previous partners wish they could change about you? That's, That's those are heavy questions. Right? Some, of are heavy. Some of them are light. There's a get acquainted deck that are you know like friendly and light. Oh, and sweet. There's, okay. There's a deep dating deck. That oh, I like deep is I like, very I use that. Uh, challenging. Let's just say. But great. I, I go use into that. that. And there's a sex deck, all about sex. Just the whole deck. There's a, no, it's only 50 questions, but no, so no. you have separate decks for dating. Yeah, there's three different decks in the in the in the Beautiful. dating game, and then there's five different decks in the getting real card game. Let me ask you something. In, in, in traditional communication sort of studies, you know, people uh, get together and they make small talk to establish safety first. That's mm -hmm. why we do small talk. I remember I researched this back when I was doing a lot of Hollywood pitching. And I noticed we come in, we talk about kids, we talk about traffic, we talk about eh, common movies that we liked, and then we get to the pitch, right? There's a natural progress of creating safety. That's what small talk does. You look for a little commonality. Oh, you're from New York. I'm from New York. Oh, you like the Dodgers. I like the Dodgers, right? And we play this little tribal game of first getting safe before we, we reveal ourselves. Do these decks, I mean, what you're doing, is this like against human nature on some level? Are you, isn't it rushing? Yeah, it's a little bit against human nature. What you're calling human nature is just basically cultural conditioning. It is cultural conditioning. It's, okay, rules, that was it's rules that we've all agreed to, but a lot of people are, for ever, ever since I've been an adult, I've lived in a subculture where we, yeah. we question those rules. No, and, I get that. I do get that. Know, I've never had... I've, I've never started a dating, almost never started a, a serious one that went anywhere, dating relationship 
based on that set of rules. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. to really dive right in. I remember, well, hey, I, I, as I, one were... guy, he came to my house for a party and we wound up getting married, but he says, his first question to Good me party. was, he looks at me and he goes, how is it in there? Uh, was that cool or what? You know, now some women would go, <laughs> what planet is he on? But I, I really love that. It. That reminds me of a beautiful question I, uh, I actually learned from Charles Eisenstein. I don't know if you know his work. Yes. But very interesting guy. And uh, he has this beautiful question that's just very simple. What does it feel like to be you? Yeah. What does it feel like to be you? It's such a beautiful question. I, lo I love that you say that. And I'm also kind of in that subculture. I'm not as Northern California as you because I live way down here in LA. But, but I mean, I'm, as I said, my current relationship, you know, first night I said, hey, by the way, here's the stupid shit I did in my last relationship that I went to therapy for and I'm committed to never doing again. I, first date, like first meeting, because I felt it was really important to where I was at emotionally at the time. And you know, I said, this is really real for me right now. And it's crucial to who I am to like say what's going on. But um, it, I would guess in, you know, there's a fearlessness in that, that mm -hmm. what you're talking about, what's going on in there, right? But most culture, I don't know global cultures, but there seems to be the need for some sort of safety first. It's not just our culture, I would think. Yeah, yeah. and I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing the need for safety. Okay. The need for safety is huge. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying that those particular rules that say that's what creates safety yeah. are the bullshit part. Okay. I think we do need to present a open, loving demeanor to the other person, to give the other person the benefit of the doubt, you know, in terms of maybe stumbling with their words or whatever, you know, we're not like looking for the first mistake or the first wrong thing. We create safety in a lot of different ways. And in the, in the book, Five Minute Relationship Repair, we talk about the things that create safety for an infant between a mother and child are eye contact, soothing voice tones, and touch. It works for me still, by the way. <laughs> <Over there. laughs> right. And that, you know, okay, you do have to talk, but talking, and I, and I don't necessarily always mean soothing voice tones. I mean, you know, you, you and I like a lot of humor. Yeah. Uh, probably most people do. Yeah. Uh, but but that, there's other things other than where are you from. And, and I would say there's absolutely nothing wrong with where are you from? Yeah, where are you I going? Ask those questions all the time. <laughs> hey, where are you going? There's a better question, right? Yeah. Where are you where, now? Where, where are you going? That's a nice question. Where are you now, right? Uh, no, it's interesting. I, I, it, there's, there's so much anxiety people have around dating, flirting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then once you're in a relationship, of course, safety. You know, like, is this person Safety gonna... gets to be actually, well, it's a big deal in dating. And then, you know, and then after a while it calms down. But, but then once you really invest in a partner, then safety gets to be a bigger deal than it ever was ever. Yes. Usually. That's what we therapists find. You know, people get more scared, like after they get married, they should feel secure. Yeah, because I remember the, the first, you know, when I got married when I was 23, and I was traveling a lot as a young guy. And I remember we were flying off to our honeymoon, and it was the first time I was ever scared on a plane because I felt like I had something to lose. Yeah, that's what it is. You know, it's like I didn't yeah, feel like I... The stakes are higher. That's really what I'm saying, too. The stakes, stakes are, higher. are higher. And so then fears of abandonment and rejection, fears of doing it wrong, or even fears that you might find out there are irreconcilable differences, and you don't want to look at that. Yeah. So then people start lying yeah. or hiding which is the after, worst. I, you know, after marriage. Right, which is the worst. Yeah, uh, too bad. What, what, what else do you want people? I mean, you've got so much wisdom. You've yeah. Got, you've got so much wisdom. What else do you want people to know? Like, just what, well, bullshit, what bullshit are people living that you just have to <laughs> rip away? One of, the, one of the things, you know, is I'm, I was mentioning helping people get more aware of themselves and what i mean by that is some of the automatic things and i mentioned a few of them things like once you've said your sentence you won't finish the sentence you keep going and and because 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 that's a that's a 
what I call a control pattern. So I have this whole list of control patterns that I want to help people be aware of. And we, we go in depth in my workshops. And in the book also. In, in the book. The book uh, and in the several of my books. Getting Real goes into control patterns. And Five Minute Relationship Repair goes in even more depth. And control patterns might be things like finishing somebody's sentence. Wanting them to, basically your hidden motive there is you want them to hurry up and finish so you can get your turn or smiling and nodding as a person's talking again. So, so you'll think that they're interested. Yeah. Um, uh, or scowling. Well, you mentioned scowling or just keeping that kind of distant look, you know, these are habits that we've developed. That yes. Keep habits and habits to, to make yourself feel like scowling when actually you're feeling inferior to the other person, but you do the above it all scowl thing to help yourself avoid the actual feeling of that. comparing yourself and, and feeling inferior. So there's all these habits, some are verbal, some are nonverbal, some are just thought habits. You make up that the other person doesn't want to have sex tonight because they're not rubbing their body all over yours. Well, that might not be, I mean, I've had people say that to me, you know, well, you didn't give me any signals that you wanted sex, so I knew you didn't want it. Well, oh. you know, you might have you might have started the signaling process, and if you had started it, I would have taken you up on it. I mean, right there. One of my favorite words is imagine. I, I, is this for, I, who was writing about this? Is imagine, not like when you do this, I think this is what it means, but I imagine. Yeah. making. Yeah, up. this is part of Gestalt therapy, and Brad Blanton teaches this. Brad teaches Brad it, yeah, Brad. I teach it in Getting Real and the Authentic Relating. Uh, will you, will you just go through that for a second? That because it's a really useful thing to know the difference between the actual data, what you actually saw, which is uh, your partner's just sitting there eating, eating her dinner, but not looking at you. You know, right. what do you imagine? Well, she's not looking at me. I guess she's not thinking about us having sex tonight like I am. Yeah, <laughs> and say it. And say, hey. just makes up all kinds of stuff. And, yeah, then, and what it makes up is often based on the, the core fear that kind of runs you in particular, because each of us has our own core fear, whether it's abandonment, rejection, being overwhelmed, being criticized, being misunderstood. Each of us has one because it, I mean, maybe one or two or three, but one that's most core. Yes. And it, if we can be more onto it and we notice our control patterns and our triggers as a doorway into self-awareness to realizing, oh, that's a tender hurting little part of me and there's a unloved child down there who did have a primary need that went unmet yeah like if you're fear of criticism maybe you never you never got acknowledged as a child and were kind of criticized maybe you had parents who expected more of you than your age and you know well you're not used to getting feedback for doing well and then so when you're this yeah you know, I remember you know, I have a son who's a, things like that. And so your childhood makes a big difference. And I want people to feel that tenderness toward that hurting part of yourself. Yes. yes. Then you won't, you know, if you continue to do this work every time you see yourself in a pattern or each time you get that rejection button triggered, you will learn how to quickly bring nurturance to yourself and soothing and presence to yourself like acceptance that that's really an okay feeling to have i love that expert i love that term by the way to bring nurturance mm -hmm. to the pain because we all everyone's got it everyone's got their pains and we don't bring nurturance we bring fuel to the fire right we yeah we 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 we, we hate that part of ourselves because it messes with our relationships and that's a sad thing because we can learn that that part of ourselves is part of our vulnerability. And when we bring that to our partner and say, honey, help me with this. This is one of my vulnerabilities. Right. And I need some reassurance that I'm enough for you. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. That's what the repair process looks like. You know, the book is called Five Minute Relationship Repair. By the way, another that's amazing. What the repair book. is it's asking for reassurance and revealing your vulnerability. Great title, also, by the way. <laughs> Who doesn't want five minute relationship repair? Yeah. Yeah, it um, really works. And it's kind of the genius, also. I, I know Brene Brown says it. Maybe you guys have been saying it for 30 years since Esalen. But, but she has that beautiful statement where she said, you know, everyone's so afraid to show their vulnerability because they they're afraid of losing people. But it's exactly our vulnerability 
that makes us feel close to people. That's when, right. Exactly. As a writer, someone who's written a lot of movies, you know, I know that as soon as a character gets real, to use your expression, shows their vulnerability, that's usually when characters bond. Absolutely. It's, oh. it's uh, you know, I've, I have said this for years. I'm that sure you have, yeah. We try, we try to appear, like the dating world is a perfect example. We try to appear really together. Sure. But it's our needs and our vulnerabilities that give another person a sense of, oh, there's a place for me to plug in here. Yes, uh -oh. a human it, being. It enrolls people and, and bonds people. Yeah, it's true. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you know, we're trying to look good. And, and you know, we're, we're in an Instagram generation now where looking good is a, is a living, <laughs> you know, for a lot of people. And, and people do end up posting their, you know, happy A plus selves. Um, I'm just curious if, if, if from your perspective, because you've been doing that, as we said, we do, you've been doing this a while. What shifts have you seen in just the last few years and how people relate or don't relate to each other? New fears, new anxieties. Hmm. You know, I'm most struck by how little things have changed, frankly. Mm, really? Particularly around the whole Me Too thing. Oh. Women marking boundaries. It's always been an issue of men in power abusing their power and, and and it's still such a huge issue. I mean, I'm really glad that it's it's coming out, but um, I thought, you know, 50 years ago when I was involved in this kind of work, you know, owning your no, owning your power, being willing to, to you know, to say, no, I'm not into that. What happened? Why didn't that catch on? You know, why didn't well, that? Well, because things haven't changed really that much in our culture. Okay. It, I mean, I've been part of a, a unique subculture all yeah. these years. Call uh, what? A unique subculture. I said all these years. Oh, all these years. So I've, you know, I mean, I pay attention to what's going on in the mainstream, but the people I affiliate with uh, say no and know how to hear no. And you, you can, you know, even somebody in power, you, 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 can, you can work that out because we believe in, you know, we, we trained in negotiation skills and, right. you know, empower, self-empowerment. But the average woman has not had the benefit as, or the average man, because men are getting caught in, in not knowing, you know, what signals to trust in a woman. And that's always been one of the, one of the pains of being a male is, you know, I don't get clear signals from the women. How, how, how many years have I been hearing that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, ever since I've been an adult and women, you know, men can't, can't hear my no. How right. long, how many years have I, and, and so if they can't hear my no, sometimes just to av avoid an argument, I give in. I'm not saying I've never done that. I have done that, but I've done it very consciously. And oh, it, uh, yeah, I have in you know, certain, uh, sex situations but they've been not not with unequal power or anything yeah um just situations i'm traveling in europe and you know somebody lets me stay at his house so i can't say i mean it's getting really juicy i'm afraid of a part of my past but you know, <laughs> no i mean but not, I, I'm not much more, like uh, uh, proud of it but it didn't hurt me at all but on a much more serious note one thing that struck me as a man Mm -hmm. is how many of these Me Too stories was that story, but with a power differential and yeah. fear. Yeah. Where women gave it, like literally gave in. And it, it's, it's, out of you, know, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to say shame on us, any yeah. of us. It's, it's good that all this is coming out, but I'm so surprised that we haven't evolved in our understanding of power dynamics because a lot of us have been teaching this for years and trying to, you know, make the people in power re realize that that doesn't get you anywhere to dominate. Right. It, just, it always backfires on you. And that's what we're seeing now, the backfiring of abuse of power. I hope we see it further and further. <laughs> I'm thinking like some people get pretty well night. Uh, <laughs> Some people have done pretty well with abuse of power. They, they reach very high positions. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, unfortunately, short-term yeah. short power grabbing still works. But, uh, but so, the, so you're asking me what's changed. Yeah. Uh, of course, social media has changed a lot of things. Unfortunately, you know, texting is, is, is often more common than 
talking to oh, someone yeah. face to face. And I'm not saying anything that a thousand other people haven't said. Right, right. Too many missed cues. Plus, it's also a way to control. Texting is a way to, if you, Ooh. you won't talk to somebody because talking Ooh. requires more spontaneity. Oh, texting yeah. is a one control. way thing. You get a chance to edit your remarks. It's just not as spontaneous. And plus, you, you can send your message and not have to read the other person's until you're darn good and ready. So it, it, all of this social media thing does sort of reinforce a culture of control. Interesting. When I would rather things be more messy and human and spontaneous, I think yeah. that leads to deeper love. No, it's I, I, you've I, gone through something together that's really uncomfortable and neither of you knew how it was going to turn out. That's what bonds people. I love that your courage, like, like when you said that, there was energy. Neither of you knew how it was going to turn out. You know, there's a joy in that. That's where, that's where real creativity resides. Exactly. In I can feel it. Yeah. Stepping into the unknown together. Beautiful. Let's not miss that, folks, by texting so much, you know. Get, at least get on the phone. I think in the next edition of, uh, of which book is it? Of, of um, uh, well, the one where I came across your control. Truth dating, I guess. Truth oh. And, no, the other oh, one, the, uh, the, the getting real. real. You have to add now texting as I don't think that was in there, but that is, uh, now I understand that as a control pattern. It can be. I, I mean, think. texting's very useful. I text. Every Hell day. yeah, but not it's for anything important. For certain things, but for, yeah. for especially getting to know somebody intimately. You know? Or handling tension and hostility. Honestly, it never just do it the, never have a fight over text would be a great ground rule to give yourself. I give that one to everybody, by the way. Yeah. That's the big one. But I love seeing it as a control pattern. Susan, this has been, uh, I could talk to you for hours and hours. And I will. I want to have you back. Uh, and I also want to come up for one of your weekend workshops. I wish I could come this weekend, actually. I didn't know it was happening. I just looked it up and saw you were teaching. Um, I will get there. Um, Dr. Susan Campbell. SusanCampbell.com. Yes. Right? Um, Truth and Dating. Wonderful book for anyone who wants to date seriously and actually meet somebody on a deep level. Couple's Journey, for those of you who are going through these stages of the journey, which are fascinating. Mm -hmm. and I have so much to say about this, but we'll talk about another time. Yeah. About, about how we bond with anything that's passionate, not just a person, but even with subjects of study. There's a whole process that actually is human and inhuman. Same process yeah. about giving ourselves over and then pulling back. It's a very natural process. Yeah, develop, you know, just studying developmental theory in all its forms is, is, a, is a deep study. And, and I'm all over that one, too. Yeah. And I just love the joy you bring to this work. I'm so happy to know you. And uh, I can't wait to have you again. Thank you. And, uh, I love you, Adam. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad we're having this talk. Thank you so, so much once again. Okay.